All right, welcome back to On the Air, the IT pro show that keeps you in the know. I'm Jeff Gretler. Jeff Gretler is really here. That's right. And thank you to Spiceworks, Rackspace, and Microsoft for making this show possible. Today, we're going to explore how Rackspace and Microsoft can help you embrace a data strategy that adds value. Uh, we have some players from Rackspace and Microsoft that are basically going to help you with the cornerstones of a modern data estate and the next evolution in IT. The TLDR of that, we're going to make your data make sense so your data makes dollars. That's right. Top trends among companies innovating with data, the people, processes, and tech needed for your data estate, and how Rackspace helps companies innovate with their data. So let's bring in these players because I am not doing this by myself. I have to answer tickets. So batting first, he is our data and AI manager from Microsoft. Please welcome Luke Fangman. Luke, how are you? Jeff, good morning. You guys, your hands are good? You can just... Relax your hands. Or do it. My hands. <laughs> so, Luke, welcome. Thank so, you. Uh, Happy to be you here. You know, I usually ask you what you did, ate for breakfast, but today we're going to have, uh, can you give me a data point about your breakfast? Whew, I guess the theme is data. I'll probably start with uh, with cups of coffee, and that's already in, almost in the double digits oh, this yeah. morning. Oh, so. yeah, I did see a little bit of a twitch going. <laughs> <laughs> that's my data point for today. All right, that'll work. We'll take that, too. So thank you, Luke. All right, next up, he's the senior sales manager, Azure product at Rackspace Technology, Matthew Lazar. Matthew, how are you? Howdy, howdy. Are, uh, we've good. got a good spot for the you hands. found a good spot. Good, yep. good. So uh, can you give me a data point about your breakfast today? Ah, uh, man, today is the last day of the month, and I am the only sales guy on this panel, so the data point for today is 198000 That is my quota for this month. It needs to be closed today, and I eat revenue for breakfast. <laughs> and you're not very hungry? No, uh, I'm, I am starving. You're so, ravished. busy day once we get done with this. Well, maybe you can have some of his coffee. Yeah, that's and you true. can just barge out the door. We got deals to close. We do. Always ABC. Always be closing. Sure. All right. Always not telling. That's right. <laughs> and batting cleanup, he's the senior product architect from Rackspace Technology. Jason Reinhardt. Jason, how are you? Hey, Jeff. How are you? Good, good. good. You have a data point about your breakfast today? It's easy. My data point zero. I don't do breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> that made it really easy. So is breakfast just turned into lunch or just, it's just no it's time for love, Dr. No, Jones? No time. No time. <laughs> Too much to do. Understandable, understandable. Well, guys, we've got a great show. We're looking forward to this. And as you already saw, we have a chat host that is going to take care of business on that side. Be warned, she's so fire, you're instinctively going to stop, drop, and roll for Sarah Emerson. Sarah, what's up? Hi. <laughs> Good job on the whole hosting thing. You're just doing everything around here. Well, you know, I really had you to look up to, so it's where I got it from. Good, good job. And thanks for finding my shirt. Was that in the server room or something? You know, maybe you shouldn't ask questions that you don't want to know the answer to. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Well, Sarah, I know you got some business to take care of over there today. Oh, absolutely, and I am so thrilled to be here because we have so many wonderful things to talk about, amazing prizes to give away. But before we start, we did um, have a poll go out in the community about a week ago. Shout out to Jawan for Rackspace. Um, and this poll, which many of you have answered, is what are some encouraging or discouraging data innovation trends that you've seen? We've already had a couple answers come in and we love them already, so keep them coming. We wanna hear more. But moving on to the part that everybody loves, our prizes. And today we have not one, not two, but three prizes plus a grand finale prize. And what you have to do for those who, it's been a minute, it's been a while, submit a question. And if your question gets featured, then you have the chance of winning a $25 Amazon gift card, which, who doesn't want that? The holidays are coming yeah. up. You can use it for anything, anyone, maybe yourself. <laughs> the other prize that we have featured today is going to be a Rackspace cooler bag, which looks amazing. You can take that anywhere, fill it up with whatever you want, sodas, Waterloo, waters, whatever you have lying around. And then the third prize that we also have is going to be a JBL Bluetooth speaker. Now that looks awesome. I don't know about you, but I listen to music all the time, and so having something like that would be amazing. But last but certainly not least, one lucky attendee today with their question selected is going to win a Nintendo Switch, the OLED model. 
and that looks fantastic. I would definitely want that. So those are the prizes that we have today. Please remember that our chat follows our community guidelines. So keep things fun, keep things spicy, but make sure you keep things professional. All right, back to you, Jeff. We think we're ready to get started. All right, let's get it. And hopefully you have our people in the community that are gonna ask our questions and then we can split the loot. Wait, oh wait, oh. We're, I said that oh. on camera. You weren't supposed to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Those gifts look sweet. So you guys brought some sweet swag with you. So we're excited to get this going. So let's do an icebreaker segment. Let's lube the pipes. Let's get the brain waves flowing. So today we're going to be talking about, and Luke, we'll start with you. We need a piece of data that captures you. Number of steps in the day, high score in a video game, the number of times rewatching the Big Lebowski. The data really brings the room together. So what's a data point that describes you? Well, uh, while I am a, a big purveyor of the dude and a lot of his work, yeah. I would say that the best data point that describes me is probably 13. And uh, that is the number of times I've seen Jimmy Buffett live. Oh, that's right. Uh, you have parrot uh, head, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. do, I'm sure, the whole experience singing along in the park. Very much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you got the dress to cosplay. There are certainly, there are certainly elements of, of hula skirts involved in, in my <laughs> wardrobe, typically, yes. That's a good run. 13's a solid run. Awesome. Matt. What about you? Um, two data points, same number, one. one. I am also the only Aggie on this panel, so we have, <laughs> Adam has one win against a top five ranked opponent. All right. Adam Aggies. <laughs> Take and we also have another one, one goal scored against Iran. That's right. In the Men's World Cup, so on the next yes. round. So That's right. USA, That's our USA. <laughs> Do a wrestling chant, I love it. Yeah, that was, that was very exciting here. We, could have broke it here live. Yeah, the news I know. one day fun. later. Yeah, we missed it. So, Jason, what about you? We need a data point that really describes That's, you. It, yeah, so this was a very tough question. This was probably <laughs> the hardest question I've ever had. Um, eight. Eight? The number of retro gaming consoles that I have. Oh, that. And they're, they're all playable, Jeff. That's what I, mean, I that's, like. That's what's cool. Yeah. So. I mean, you're talking to the right community. That so yeah. you, you have, and these are the big. Starting ones. You're not the, talking about the little no, new start, retro. Starting at the at the Atari 2600. You know, the big guy. Yeah. You know, and then on up to the Xbox Series. Joystick and all, playing Yard for Ben. I've got the Do paddles. It. Got the, the paddles too. The, the oh, little paddles. little paddles and then joysticks and then uh, we we upgraded to one of the joysticks that have the two buttons on the top. Oh, nice. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. perfect for brain breaks awesome. during the day if you're yep. working from home. Absolutely, you just go jump to a console. Mm -hmm. I love it. These are these are great data points. I think we're gonna have a great show. So let's get started. Luke, we'll start with you. Uh, what's Microsoft's philosophy on the role of data in modern business? Well, I think maybe to start that off, I'll debunk a little bit around what we describe as modern data and modern data estate, which I feel like are kind of buzzwords and terminology thrown out a lot. Right. Modern data, honestly, just describes the pace and the size at which data has accelerated in the last couple of years. Okay. And modern data estates are really just the infrastructure that we have built to be able to ingest, store, process, and actually use that data. So boiling that back down to an overall philosophy is that Microsoft, and you know, I feel like most of us all believe, data is only valuable, proportionate to the amount of people that can access and make use of that. Right. So anything that can be meaningful to analyze, bring it to truth, and actually use it to increase operations, you know, add safety to your environment, there's a lot of opportunities for us to actually use it. So that's, that's overarching the philosophy. And then everything that we do in between is just kind of fulfilling that, that prophecy is, or philosophy uh, to give more access to people in a trusted and secure way, uh, but also, you know, making it usable to discover insights you didn't even know were possible before. Right. So you're saying you can't have a livable household if all your stuff is in storage, just it's stuffed yeah. in there, right? You have to have it livable, make it make sense. Yeah. Make the dumb data smarter. Yeah, right? that's we were talking true. about that earlier, so that is. good. Matt, well, what about you? What are some of the demands you're seeing from Rackspace data customers, and what opportunities are there to harness these data in new ways? Oh, heaps of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for wearing your Rackspace red. That's right, Much Rackspace appreciated. red. Sure. Yeah, very well done. <laughs> um, tagline of the week is gonna be, or tagline of the year should be, just get modern, right? Rackspace is, our mission and mantra is modernize our own customers, right? We've been in business since <clears throat> 1998, right? Founded by three Linux geeks out of San Antonio, Texas. You know, That's chairman nice. investor Graham Weston gave a million dollar check at a burger joint off of 410 and taking that philosophy of managed services on top of Linux boxes, right? But helping to evolve those customers um, up and out of the rack, right? Moving away from your physical hardware, your Hyper-V, your ESX environments, moving those into infrastructures of service within Azure, 
and then hopefully making that next leap into platform as a service, right? Moving those data states into you know data lakes, data lake houses, right? Uh, democratizing data, it is data for all, right? right? And that's really where our mantra and our mission is within Rackspace is helping our customers to evolve, constantly gaining more and evolving their their technology stack. And again, we have customers that's been with us for 20 years, 15, 20 years, and they've evolved, started with online exchange boxes, a lot like Spiceworks, right? Moving up through that modernization, but it's now time to, to cut the cables, literally cut the cables, move out of a Rackspace data center, move into Azure, and, and let the data be free, and let the data work for you. Free the data. Uh, you you have just to. came up with like three different pieces of swag <laughs> in that one statement. I see Get Mod, where you're going to have all your retro stuff. Not the games, though. The games can stay retro, but you're just going to merge it into something more modern. And then free the data. Right? That's a data. shirt. Free Britney, free the data. That's the way to go. Uh, one of the guys on my team has a great shirt that says, uh, data is the new bacon. <laughs> so, you know, we'll add that to the hashtag of things. I love it. All right, next question, uh, David, please. So we have some stuff that we're going to be discussing here, so let's keep the conversation going. With Luke, uh, how do you think Azure customers can better harness data? Well, I, I think, you know, Matthew just kind of alluded to one of them, and, and we talk about it all the time, that a lot of organizations and customers are really focused on increasing their data capabilities with the technology, but, you know, there's a wide swath of solutions. You know, pro products are always going up, down, and around, and if you follow Gartner, it changes every, you know, every quarter, every yes. year. But the reality is people forget the other side of the coin, and that's developing and culturing a data culture within their own organization. And so that piece of, yes, you need to invest in, in kind of cutting the cord, getting modern, moving and virtualizing into platform as a service, especially in, in cloud services. Not primarily cloud, but certainly a lot of yeah. opportunities to, to scale a lot faster in the cloud. But it is fostering that data culture that we see, you know, wild, uh, I would say like wild variety in our largest customers. And the ones that survived and went through COVID in a high data culture in the time uh, I mean, honestly, of just intense volatility. It was the ones that had the best data culture, not the best data capabilities, that captured the most insights, that found the most efficiencies, and came out of that a lot stronger than their competitors. That one hundred percent. I was. I saw the Joker in my head. It's like you, you caught the squirrel, but now I don't know what to do with it. You have all these squirrels. What do you do with it? So it totally makes sense that you want to have this data, like. Data culture is a yeah. great way to put it. Uh, data discipline, another way just to make all these flows make sense so it can make dollars, exactly. So Matt, like, what services do Rackspace offer to help customers achieve those data-driven goals with that in, in Azure? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of going back to the mindset of there, everyone is still kind of beginning to move into that modern data state, right? We call them modern customers, uh, cloud-native customers, um, and we're trying to evolve our customer base into that. And right now it's kind of two steps. First step is to clean up and stabilize, right? You can't improve what you can't measure. So we gotta be sure we get a, a great baseline being able to run initial assessments and help customers to understand truly what do you have today, what's in the cabinet across a Rackspace data center, your on-prem data center, whatever that might look like. So clean up and stabilize. Number one, we do that through a series of managed services. We have a new offering that was just launched about 15 days ago known as Modern Operations, being able to come in and provide you know, hands-on keyboard activities, full monitoring, triage of alerting. So again, owning those type of services on behalf of the customers so they can take their limited IT staff and apply that to data, data practices and data engineering. Uh, the second thing is definitely the operationalize and innovate, right? And taking that customers, once you've stabilized, got the baseline, all right, now how do I operationalize that data and how do I innovate on that data? So operationally looking at helping customers to build out their CICD pipelines, modernizing, right? Helping them to develop and onboard a DevOps posture, right? right? Being able to do that through not only high quantity, but high quality, and then innovate, right? Helping customers to really take that next cut, right? Do that new modern data state that really, again, Microsoft really lays out that, that jet stream of here's where the mission is. We kind of come behind that jet stream. We help customers put the pieces together. And we do that through a lens of elastic engineering, which is a very agile based approach. Yeah. Customers get a dedicated pod of, of nine engineers and architects. Uh, we meet on two week sprints and we're going through a backlog of activities and we assign a customer a bucket of hours over a three, six, nine month period. And we groom through those activities in a very do with approach to where we're meeting with the customer. We have homework, customer has homework, but we're coming together and that customer leaves smarter than when they started because again, it is together, we're in this together, we're not doing it on your behalf. We also do have professional services. So sometimes customers say, I don't have time to iterate with you, I don't have time to be agile, I just want you to go and do this migration and go away. That's fine, we'll do a scope of work, we'll do the migration behind the scenes and we'll come back to the customer with a, uh, a deliverable. But again, it's really up to that customer, not only the, the project at hand, but how engaged do you want to be? 
where do you want to be and how can we do this with you? And again, it's, it's an ever evolving practice, but it, we've been in the services business for over 22 years and managed services is at our, at our core of what we do. So I think it's just the natural evolution of taking managed services and moving it more into sometimes some project-based work. I, you know, yeah, everything you're saying are, are ringing all the bells for me because I think a modern IT environment is all about relationships, good relationships, whether it's with your coworkers or with your vendors or your partners that actually will help you get the most out of everything because there's just too many blind spots and everything's moving too fast. So when you're singing all the right songs to me, when you're just like, we're gonna help you do this, that's all I needed. I need more stuff off of my plate because nothing ever really stops. Like, this audience knows nothing ever really. Yeah. <laughs> we don't get those breaks. So uh, speaking of relationships, yeah. Jason, like what kind of assessments do Rack, does Rackspace provide to the customers? Yeah. And, like what? It, I, so Jeff, just to, just to follow on what, what Matthew was talking about and, and to carry on from what Luke was, was talking about with philosophies and, and ways of doing things, you know, the reason why we call the new offering modern operations because it's a different way of thinking about how you treat the public cloud. Because it is, it's a transition. It's a, it, it's it's a it's a different way that you that you build your business processes. It's a different expectation for your people and what they're expected to learn and and do and know. And everybody talks so much about the technology, but the you know it's more than just the technology. And so that's where the solution assessment uh, stuff that Rackspace does. That's what's so valuable out of the assessment programs. And I. I think the better question is what what doesn't Rackspace you know assess right. you know I mean it, I mean we'll we'll pretty much assess you know most things but when it comes to data you know the just the just the Rackspace foundational assessments of of understanding where you are today and then what does that roadmap and what does that blueprint or translation look like for how things need to be down the road once you've started on your journey you know because yeah. that's what it's I mean that's really ultimately what it's all about is. You know, I got to know where I am to know where I'm going to be, and then how to get there. Right. You know, that's the core tenet of any of the assessments that we do. And and it's, it, again, it's again, having those relations. Yeah. And I, I kind of liken it to like getting a U-Haul to move out of your house versus hiring a movers. Because when yeah. you notice when you hire the movers, it's like that went really fast. You made that look really easy. It's like, look, because we do this every day. We have multiple customers we're doing. You're trying to do it just this once. You're doing it by yourself. You're yeah. trying to save some money. It's exhausting. It's tiring. Data's it, hard. It, it never stops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Data's I mean, hard. The, the data yeah. is really hard to wrangle, to mm -hmm. make it make sense. So I, yeah. having those types of partners is invaluable. So Jason, along those lines, how does Rackspace empower those customers when it comes to their data state? Well, I mean, it's data that we're collecting in the assessments. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, I mean, that's, you know, that's true. I mean, the, the data from the assessment drive the outcomes, you know. We want our decisions to be data driven. And that's the value that, that we bring out of the assessment program is we are making data driven decisions, you know, based on the inputs of where your business is, the business challenges and the problems that you want to overcome. Here are solid data points to actually get you started down the path. You know, the, there, there's no magic bullet answer, you know, to any of that. It's, it's, you know, more a collection of here are the possibilities. You know, you, you hear the term the art of the possible. You know, that's, that's what you're, you're really getting out of the assessment is here's the art of the possible, you know. And then to add on to that, hopefully through the process we've developed a partnership and we'll help you down that path awesome. you know and help you realize the art of the possible and, and what's like more know. swag Look, yeah. the art of the swag <laughs> the art of the possible let me also add on because yeah. I, I think it's an important uh, piece on here on how you actually empower is one of the pieces is that we, we typically see early on the stage that most organizations and, and customers are not aligning early on yeah. giving access to their people to a different skill set. Right. And and what, what Jason and, and Matthew were talking about on how do you do managed services on, on getting handle of a migration with experts that kind of know a little bit about the technology, mm -hmm. but your people are the ones that always understand the 
business processes and your business the best. So you want to unlock them to be able to learn from experts that yeah. they can bring in and, and work alongside. And that's always been the best training is being able to work on a team like with a Rackspace team and, and Elastic Engineering is a great example of this. You can work alongside people that have been doing this across industries, across yeah. companies for years. And that type of you know disseminate uh, the knowledge across your own team becomes invaluable. And right. that, that is that is training you cannot pay for. You yeah. know? And that's, that's an opportunity for that. a lot of yeah. people to grow. Again, those relationships are invaluable because you're bringing a lot more to the table of that on staff you might not have the time to do yourself and 100%. the understanding to do that and you're going to help fill in those blind spots so it's good I just want to send everyone a reminder keep those questions coming we have some questions coming in sarah has some sweet swag that she's going to be handing out after she reads your question live on the air so all right next uh what are uh, Luke? What are the cornerstones of a modern data state with the businesses that can focus with Microsoft and Rackspace? Yeah, I, I can't believe this is the first time I'm actually uttering this, this <laughs> phrase. Is, is the cornerstones really come down to people, process, and technology? And I I know you know Jason mm -hmm. and Matthew and I were kind of talking about this even before airing. Was you know I, I feel like I always put the people and process first because a lot of organizations they want to select the technology and the product, and you know sometimes we're looking for a silver bullet type solution to solve everyone's problems right. without focusing on the foundation which is your people and processes of your own business and within people you've got skill sets you've got training you even have new ways of operating new business new operating models that have to be put in place before you're going to make an enormous you know transition to cloud operations which you know in the most cost optimized way to, to run the cloud it does fundamentally change how you run and operate your business right and then the technology you know between what Microsoft offers in, in Azure and what Rackspace can kind of help customers understand is how to maximize and run a cost optimal environment within the, the technology available at that time, but also set you up for success as that technology continues to advance and change. Yeah. And so the cornerstones, like I always try to hammer this in, it is PPT, it's not technology <laughs> yeah. first, it's always people and process. The, the technology is easy, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean the, techn the technology is largely finite. I mean, it is what it is, you know, but the people and the process, I mean, that's the really hard part, you know. But the right tools, again, data visibility. Exactly. Right? Power BI on top of your data state gives Setting you more visibility into data. Right? And it really comes back yeah. to, okay, now you've been sitting on this data for 20 years, now you have better visibility. What data can you monetize? Right? The tagline right. from Inspire Ignite this year, the yeah. big conference was from Microsoft, do more with less. Yeah. That's a whole thing, right? You have less people, less headcount, everyone's trying to really stream, streamline their P&L, and it's like, okay, well, you're sitting on heaps of data. Yeah. Like, how can we help you monetize this data to increase and develop new revenue streams, which I don't know any board of directors that would ever turn down a new revenue stream no. for, <laughs> for data that you've been sitting on for a while. But again, it comes to the people understanding that, knowing the business processes, understanding the alignment of those procedures, and then here's your technology. And again, it's the, the visualization within that data set that is really going to take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. Right. You heard it here. Power is with the people, right? <laughs> you know, especially in IT, we, we've always heard like, you know, your people are your biggest weakness when it comes to like security. But in this case, your people are your, you empower your people Great. to That's understand no, you're going to turn over yeah. around like, oh, wow. We have a whole new stream of revenue now that we're going to be able to do that by empowering and training, just having everybody understand all the steps involved. And I think a lot of us, especially in IT, you know, we get stuck in this maintenance mode, right? We're just trying to keep every, you know, mm -hmm. we're literally all the spinning plates will come over here and we'll come in over here. So having those partners like Rackspace and Microsoft to come in and just like help us with those words like we're going to keep this spinning but don't forget this because that fine line between maintenance and then innovating to start making some money yeah. because you know we're not in the business of widgets anymore we're in the business of digits and that data that we're sitting on is going to make some cash and then we're going to stay employed right yeah, which man. is the goal <laughs> if i could do a real quick plug yeah. for microsoft um they do a phenomenal job thank you company check later um <laughs> they do a phenomenal job with with empowering employees through Microsoft Learn, role-based certification trainings. Um, that's a big emphasis for us, not only within Rackspace, but all of our customers were constantly pushing training and really seeking that uh, advanced knowledge, advanced skill set. How do you apply it? And again, these are these are really great certification tracks, MicrosoftLearn.com. Go to it. If you haven't done it, go to it and, and really begin to understand how do I use these Microsoft tools to not only further my career as an individual, but my my you know, my skill set within the organization today. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, again, I love that that employing of, right, 
IT tends to be like the, you know, well, we're just like, we're just an expense. Like, no, we do drive value. Mm -hmm. When we find money, that's driving revenue, right? So we are not just an, ex we're not an expense, damn it. <laughs> All right, great conversation, guys. So I think it's time to loosen it up with a game. Do you want to play a game? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's right. We have a game that we're going to play that's called The Data Is Right. That's right, and right before the show, we came up. Why wasn't it the spices yeah. right? <laughs> Honestly, that was brilliant. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. fantastic. Awesome. So I think you're going to be really familiar with this game if you ever stayed home sick from school or you just or apparently you watched an awesome documentary on Netflix about it. We are going to be borrowing the rules from The Price is Right. So the whole idea here is I'm going to ask you a few statistics about the importance of data. Whoever guesses the right number. One dollar, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was coming, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, if you guess that right number without going over, wins the round. And yes, one dollar is an acceptable answer. Are you guys ready to play? So you got your handy paddles there. You got some stickies there. We will just, that's, that's the, we're going non-tech on this. That'll be our digital holdup. All right, here we go. Number one. According to McKinsey Research, data-driven businesses are about how many times more likely to acquire a customer than their non-data-focused counterparts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do the yodeling music. For that I always remember the yodeling. <laughs> 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 all right, we all have answers. <laughs> don't, he don't did. Copy people. <laughs> All right, Luke, we will start with you. Let's see your answer. Uh, I went with 8x. 8x, huh? Yeah. You want to Google I, it, didn't you? I feel like from, yeah, uh, from digital Google. strategy, uh, like McKinsey, they like nice round numbers, so I was going with, with 8. Yeah, 8 is infinity, so I, I like it. All right, Matt, how about you? Um, well, Jeff, I went with 8 as well. <laughs> I had to make my 8 a little bit more round. My calligraphy <laughs> wasn't really good this morning, so it is a good rounder. So I went 8. That was nice. All right, Jay. Ten, ten times, ten right. times ten. more likely. I'm quite a bit more optimistic than these guys. All right, <laughs> you are the optimist. <laughs> All right, guys. so I do have the answers here. Let's see who our winner is. <laughs> the answer is 23 times Whoa. more likely. What? Jason, the optimist, you are the winner of round ones. Very good. So yeah, you're right. Good job. Okay. Optimism is the way to go. Uh, Hope will keep us alive. That's why I didn't win the Powerball. That's right. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've ever won anything. All right. <laughs> you haven't won yet. <laughs> yeah, we got two more, two more questions. Let's see if you can keep that momentum going. All right, number two. How much more likely are they to retain that customer? Same question. Just an add-on to that. How much more likely are they to keep their customer based on that data that they're housing? And all right. Oh, you change your mind? <laughs> Always. He's very one dollar bomb. You know, it's coming. It's coming. All right, Luke, let's say what do you got? I went a little more dramatic. This oh time. man, yeah. sixteen wow. really big. Wow. Sixteen times yeah. more likely. A lot more likely to retain. I like the drama. Drama. <laughs> Now, what about you? you oh. 12. 12 times, 12 times more likely. All right. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. Well, five. Five times five more likely. Times. <laughs> we're going the inverse here. Pass yeah. Pessimistic. All right, we're reverse. Wow. Let's see if the strategy pays off. How much more likely are they to retain that customer? The answer is 19 times more oh, likely. Man. Yeah, what? there you go, Luke. Yeah, All right, we're... we got 1-1. One, one. You're making Matt, stuff Matt, you got to get on the board I'm, here. I know. Or we're going to have that awkward... Other game well, show, Jeopardy. Have you seen the eight in football season? Is, <laughs> I mean, give me a bunch of goose eggs. Jeez. All right, the last one. So we're just building on this same question. How much more likely are they to be profitable as a result of that first section of data-driven businesses? How many acquire customer than their non-data-focused counterparts? So who are the ones that are just playing Jenga and praying to keep that balance going and who's actually building a better foundation for their business. Oh, Matt's already ready. He wants to get on the board. Are we gonna have a three-way tie? We'll see. Yes. That's what you're hoping for. All right, Luke, let's see. First one up. 
I can't believe we did this again. <laughs> 30 <laughs> times more likely to be profitable we're, we're than just the result. We're there. We're there. <laughs> I know. We, I used to, we used to work together. Oh, okay. <laughs> I get it. You're the same. And plus, you're just talking about end of month stuff. You're ready to barge out the I, door. I, so, I, all about that I, profit. I know, yeah. Always 30, be closing 30 times 30 more times. likely. I mean, what Always be closing 30 be times more likely to be profitable than never. 50 times more likely. Now we're talking. He swung for the fences. Oh, man. So, let's see if that's. That strategy paid off. All right, how much more likely are they to be profitable as a result? 19 times oh. more likely. So Ooh, technically well, we had a tie in that one, but that, Luke, that makes you the winner. Yeah, Luke, right? job. Yeah. yeah. Luke is, is the, the winner. winner. All right, good job. Thank you. I hope you stay an optimist over that, though. Don't let that, <laughs> don't let that shake you. Don't ever let it dull your sparkle. Just Absolutely go not. home, Absolutely dominate not. in asteroids, and like, I am smart enough. That That's dumb right. data will not outsmart me. You need some donkey call. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you. That was fun. So, but let's get more fun involved. Let's get the community involved. So, Sarah, is there some questions over there simmering about data? Oh, definitely. We, we have a bunch of um, really awesome questions that have come in. Are you guys ready? Are mm -hmm. you ready? Way <laughs> <We> go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, our first question is coming from Wit B. What is modern in terms of data storage? Hmm. Mr. Architect, I'll let you start. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> What's modern in, in data storage? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, as a former storage architect myself, um, you know, it's, it's ones and zeros. But in a modern environment, specifically talking about Azure, um, you're starting to think about data lakes, um, Data factories, um, blob, um, you know, pages, queues. I mean, all of the things that Microsoft is making available um, for repositories for your data. I mean, that's that's the resting place for a modern data storage environment. You know, um, how you access and what you do with it in those uh, locations. I mean, that's really. That's really the power of the Azure platform. You know, it's it's more than just about how it's stored. You know, I'll add to this too. Is is like the the modern side of this is it, when we talked about this kind of uh, maybe even in, in the pre work is a little bit around the coupling of uh, cheaper storage within you know blob and, and data lake style architectures. Yeah. Prior, I would say everyone threw everything into a lake and it became more of a swamp. So yeah. what we've done in the modern side is we've layered in cop capabilities like Azure Databricks and within Synapse Analytics to, to layer on top of that processing capabilities on top of cheap blob storage right. so that you can actually get the best of both worlds. You know, we call that the lake house architecture. Yep. Um, you know, and something that we typically work through is, is the modernized, you know, we're still storing it similar in, in blob store and, and cheaper storage in the cloud, but it's what we've uh, enabled to process and, on type of cheap storage. Well, yeah, and then it goes back to what do you want to do with that data? You know, uh, you typically see the three tier data architecture. You know, everything is cold. Um, you're doing things with it. You're teaching machine learning. You're, you're teaching all of your AI and stuff out of, out of that you know, bigger cold storage that really isn't doing anything, you know, you put that in a blob or something like that. And then you've got something that is that is a little bit more accessible from a data practice in the middle, that's your warm area. And then you're doing a little bit more advanced things. Maybe that's a, um, I don't know, it just depends on what business process you're, you're right. using your data for. And then, you know, your hot tier, that's where everything lands. And that's where the really, you know, the, the meat of all the processing does, and, in, and each one of those different pieces has a different type of storage platform associated with it that you would, that you would want to use. So, I mean, right. really. Optimize for cost. Yeah. 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 Well, let's, let's kind of take it even more simplistically, move technology out of it, focus on people and processes like data retention policy. Like yeah, yeah. loosen the grip, legal. You don't need to hold on to 20 years of data. Oh um, yeah. yeah, you know is that? how <laughs> accurate is that? And again, Luke, working in the oil and gas industry, like how accurate is that drill data from 10 years ago? Yeah, how like why do you even have this? So it's uh, just kind of know what you're storing, why you're storing it. To, to Jason's point about the multiple tiers, absolutely not saying that you got to get rid of all of it, but be cautious of your Azure bill and how much of your Azure bill is just because you're holding on to data that is really yeah. for whatever reason compliance. But again, legal, let go. Right. Prune out some data and help save some 
save a couple save pennies. Yeah. Jeff Goldblum yeah. said it in Jurassic Park. Just because you could doesn't mean you should. <laughs> exactly. Right? It's just like, you know, this data it sometimes could be detrimental if you're holding on to it too long. And it's like, does it have any value? But now you're holding it. Yeah. Now you got to do something with it or you're going to have to pay for it. There's just mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't have you that value. You secure it. Yeah, you mm -hmm. got to secure it because yeah. it's still, you still got to catch it. Mm -hmm. You know, you still got to protect yeah. it. That's a great question, Whitney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was good stuff. All right, Sarah, you got another question brewing over there? Definitely. Next up, uh, we have a question from Death by Band-Aid. Mm. Analytics and data points are nice. What's the most used data point that admins target? Hmm, interesting. Hmm. I, I'll probably start on, and I'll, I'll try to keep it a little bit. Most admins that I speak to are they're they're looking for like the top three amount of what is the most used data, uh, like in their lake, or if it's being surfaced in a Power BI report, if it's being accessed or queried in like a SQL Server. They want to know what is the most accessed uh, piece of my data and who's using it and how many unique people, and they like to kind of filter down their data assets from that. So as an admin. That, that seems like something simple that everyone should know, but it's if you don't have the structures in place, that's a hard question to find sometimes. Right. And so we work with admins a lot just to be able to answer the question, what's the most popular data set that I have and how many unique users are, are using that on a daily basis? And so th those are the two top ones we get asked a lot to and help with. That 100% makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. You do want to see just because you're sitting on a wad there doesn't like doesn't mean that it's being used and doesn't right. mean it necessarily has any value. So having those checkpoints to see who is coming in or out and then find a way to fine tune it, to make it so. That was a good question. Well, and then and then sometimes too. I mean to follow along with that is, I don't know what I have. I, I, That's I, big. You know I'm I'm not fully aware of where things stand and and what's going on where exactly. You know. Um, Especially for some, you know, smaller organizations that that may not be quite as mature, you know, and that's the power of the assessment piece, right? Yeah. Is is understanding and getting the the lay of the land of how things are, you know, and yeah. then having those, you know, finding the data points that you should be worried about because some some organizations may not know what I need to be looking at, you know. Yeah, and sitting on like the is there a thing? Is it like data debt where you think about like technical debt? Like you just have this bloat of people coming oh, yeah. in and then like oh, yeah. maybe some people leave and they don't even understand that portion of the business anymore. You're just getting this tribal knowledge that's only portions of it are getting passed on. So now you have something It's like, well, I don't know, we've always done it that way and no one's ever really took the time to look at it and right. understand it. It has a lot of correlations to almost like identity management in Active Directory. Bob oh, said yeah. Bob said of AD 20 yeah. years ago, and we're not touching it because Bob got hit by a bus. <laughs> this is same Bob. thing with data. We're just sitting on all this data and yeah. we don't want to do anything with it or we don't want to we don't want to delete it, we don't want to prune it. We're just unsure because we had one or two people that did it and now they've left the organization. So again, the democratization of data, giving it to everybody so everyone has visibility and then you can make a group conscious decision on this is what I need to be doing with my data. Right, uh, yeah, we always blame Bob. Whenever, oh, Bob yeah. whenever Bob leaves, it's just like, <laughs> Bob did that, I don't know why that's set up. But here, you know, you bring up a great point. There's, the great thing is, like, you can turn something off and you can find out what it does. The terrifying thing is, you can turn something yeah, off and, and you find can out find what out what it does. Yeah, absolutely. And that's great, yeah. and it's also terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, good question. All right, Sarah, we got some more questions. They're simmering, people want some swag. Oh, for sure. Right. People are filling in with the questions here, so buckle in. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, what our Roy wants to know, what makes a good data culture? What are some specific examples? Oh, man. I'll start That's easy. I'm going to go because Rackspace is an organization mm -hmm. that we are cornerstone on, on the strength finder. So when you work at Rackspace, you go through your strength assessments, you understand it. And I think the number one thing within a data culture is you've got to have individuals that are in the learner mindset. Yeah. you got to be willing to learn, and if you're not, then you're going to get passed up by somebody else that's going to come into the organization that does want to learn and wants to flex some muscle and show, I've learned this, this is how I can apply it. So don't be scared of new technology. Do not be scared of the new services. Embrace them. I'll go back to Microsoft Learn. Get schooled, right? Educate yourself. Do yourself a favor and learn about it. That single systematis has been something that's been in the industry for a long time, right? And it's just you—you you want to keep doing what you know, but you—you you know, if you don't innovate in your own career, right, learning new things, you are—it's mm -hmm. going to get you one way or another. Yeah, on, on all that there, so even a best practice, and specifically like when they ask about the data culture, what we see 
honestly, is a best practice. Some of the best organizations, they have two formal groups, and that's a community of practice and a community of excellence or a center of excellence. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. center of excellence has become, you know, it, it's a way to kind of organize and centralize and govern. And then the community of practice is exactly what Matthew's talking about. It becomes users in the business that are interested in driving analytics, learning a lot more structure. And those two combined become almost in a very intense good nucleus of data culture. Mm -hmm. We see that across the, the top organizations on the planet have these formal structures and informal communities that meet monthly, they educate each other, they learn from mistakes. But you know, a lot of people are asking us, well, how, how do we set up the best in breed? I'm like the best in breed started five years ago with a lot of mistakes. And they, yeah. their communities built around each other and they learned and now they're, they're at a place where they're kind of running really well. So well, that's best practice and, for data culture. So, uh, yeah, I mean, talking about the, the center of practice and the center of excellence, you know, those are great for enterprise, you know. But, the, you know, the, the smaller customers out there that, that do have valuable data that they need to mine and they need to figure out how to use, you know, that's where... That's where you should lean on a partner to be your center of excellence. Right. You, you know, I mean, the the whole point of all of that is just to have a frame of uh, a frame of reference and a and a guiding a guiding star, if you will, on you know what what you want to do with this, and then some you know uh, support and and education and, and advisement as as you go. You know, I mean, that's that, I mean that's really uh, you know both of yeah. both of what you guys were talking about. That's all. You know. No, and that 100%, like, again, we were talking about relationships earlier, yep. and just, it's valuable. It will bring value in the enterprise. In the small and medium business, it's vital, yep. right? Because you Absolutely. just don't have enough people. You don't know what you don't know. You have to, it's like being jumped from all angles, and you're getting it from all shots, and having yep. those part who've been in, you know, it's not like these are fly-by-night companies, right? Yep. I mean, been around and seen it all, and as data, as, storage became cheaper it almost became detrimental in a way because it's so cheaper and easier to just like just put it here just, just put it up. here i have to make this okay. migration i don't know just forklift yeah. it over and put it here without even looking what then finally it's like what the hell is in there like what are we moving here there's there's tons and tons of data is there any value why are we moving who's using it inventory it to and see who's actually accessed it i mean Jeff, this is all perfect. and so that's that's a good point to follow on with that because when you do things like that in the cloud it costs money it does mm -hmm. yeah now and it's the, and so now you've got to have this culture of of everybody has to be fiscally responsible yeah you know i mean not not only are you focusing on the technology and now this new process of how you're treating your data but now it's the it's the fiduciary responsibility that you have when you're right. operating in the cloud, you know? Yeah. And so you have to think, I mean, everybody does, you know, not just the C-suite, but the, the admins, the engineers that are that are taking care of this every day, they've got to be cognizant of those things. Yeah, so. and and legal compliance. No, yeah. you're not going to just throw it on a drive mm -hmm. and put it here. There's there's right. liability with that, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that kind of culture, I think, and that speaks for all of IT, having that kind of, like, we're all in this together, treat it like your own money, treat it like your own data. That's how you're going to stretch not only your career, but the business. So good stuff. Sarah, mas por favor. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah we're okay. ready. Our next question comes from SkillPoint. What steps should organizations take to ensure vendors have reliable data security practices in place? Mm. That's a good question because you know you, you see a lot of like questionnaires that you had like before you're going to touch our stuff we're going to need you to ch you know check all these boxes but what what would you guys like in a uh, what you've seen I'll I'll probably be very quick here and this is this is a little bit around of experience and I, check your vendor on what they what their response was the last time they had a vulnerability mm -hmm. yeah. and and that's because it is not if you have a vulnerability it's, it's when. when and it's about the response afterwards so right. you know you know, you can see the ones who are, are top of security, they they have consulting firm and, and people around the world like trying to hack them constantly. They pay for that just so they can discover vulnerabilities before they become issues. And then what is the response following? Um, you know, that that's my biggest piece of advice there. That's huge. Nobody wants to end up on the news, yeah. ever. Yeah. Do not end up, like do not be yeah. trending that yeah. way. <laughs> and I think you gotta pick, gotta pick the best of breed, right? And Microsoft, uh, bar none, is leaps and bounds above the security world from AWS and GCP perspective. You can just go anywhere on the Microsoft website, especially on the compliance page, and look at the list of all the compliancy. Um, but beyond that, it's really helping customers to understand, okay, 
Azure is my backbone. It is compliant to this level, but I also have my fiduciary responsibility as an admin um, within the security team to own this. So it's being able to bring all that telemetry that you're getting from all the different sources, being sure you're bringing it to log analytics, surfacing it through a single pane of glass SIM like Sentinel, and then being able to see that, right? You can't triage what you can't see. And so right. you can't just push it all off of Microsoft and say, well, Azure has it secure. Oh, absolutely. But what are you doing the last mile, if you will, from your own infrastructure, right. from your own perspective, with your own procedures, but again, being sure that you, you are being able to look at that through a single pane of glass and be able to, uh, again, have those remediations at the ready. Yeah, you have to stay vigilant. Totally agree. Jason, you want to add anything? No, that's, that I mean, that's, that's, that's spot on. That's yeah. Spot, right on the money. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Sarah, let's can, can you have another question for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. Next up is from Rascal Forest. Rascal. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. I like it. It's awesome. <laughs> As network technology becomes better, quicker, more resilient, and more broadly available, will we ever see a day in which local storage is no longer necessary? Ooh, that's really a philosophical question. Yeah, because I mean, it's in, we're, we're talking about like defining modern where you think of current, because we're talking about all these practices as the world is changing around us and now like literally you have business sprawl where everybody's working for everywhere, so what is local anymore? I was just thinking right? that, Jeff. Yeah, what, like, is what, is, what is local? Yeah, we don't uh, even you, know. You know, right. I mean, even even back in the days of you, you know um, sand silos. I mean, those aren't. I mean, they're local to a data center, but you've you've co-located all of your data onto a singular storage platform. You know, for block stuff, and then you probably have got some type of you know file and object storage and some type of NAS or whatever. But you know, I I think data ha or data has been decentralized for a long time. It's just, I think, the, the move to the cloud and how data is being perceived, it's just finally becoming apparent to, to people that data's not been local for a long time. Right. You know? Uh, and to move at the speed of cloud, you have to be in the cloud, right? To use, yeah. again, like app services, be able to use platform as a service, functions, automation, spin up, spin down infrastructure. People think about that from more or less the app stack. And then, unfortunately, some people still say, well, I want my data on-prem, because my data is more secure on-prem, but I'm going to put my apps out in Azure. It's like, well, you can't defy physics, right? You're trying to do that <laughs> connectivity over a fiber line, like, it's just not going to work. So, yeah. to that point, if you want your infrastructure to operate at, at size and scale and efficiencies, it's all got to move at one place, right? Until somebody figures out something different about physics, but it's still ones and zeros going over a fiber line. So, everything has to, has to live together, outside of you, maybe your one terabyte local drive to have all your family photos. I mean, outside that, nothing nothing is stored local. You know? I mean, yeah, your data will be safe if you lock it in a bank vault in a, on a disk, but like, are you gonna talk to it and is it gonna have yeah. any value? Yeah. <laughs> no one's ever gonna get to it, and that's the problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna ever be able to get uh, to it. There's a lot of developers out there right now that are completely disagreeing with us because when you're pulling down code to you know, start developing the next feature or squashing the next bug. I mean, you're pulling down data locally and you're working with it locally, but there are even solutions around that as well so that you don't you don't have to run into that situation, right? You know? Or maybe you do it like Pied Piper on Silicon Valley where the data Absolutely. is stored everywhere. It's Where's all the over data? the place. It's, it's everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, yeah, we got some questions still. So we're going to try to get to all of them, so we'll make it a little bit of a lightning thunder round and see how quick we can get all of these going. So Sarah, fire away. Yes, Shoot three them. more, three more. Three more, all right. Zach IT wants to know. What's up, Zach? In terms of starting to build skill sets and knowledge, what is a good starting point for those who want to get a better understanding of Microsoft's data management space? Call it out again. You've, been, you've called it out twice. Microsoft Learn. <laughs> yep. Microsoftlearn.com. Uh, it's the Bible of all things education for Microsoft. Um, it's just absolutely amazing. And then, um, Luke, would you like to maybe plug our friend over at Microsoft <laughs> well, and his YouTube channel? Well, I was going to say, you know, John Savile, YouTube is a oh, great resource. So God, yeah, I'll awesome. rattle off. John yeah. Savile, okay. read, read his stuff, watch his YouTube. Enterprise DNA mm -hmm. is also one of my absolute favorite Power BI uh, if you want to learn visualization, and then Guy in a Cube. Those are my three YouTube channels. Channels that have taught me almost everything. Yeah. YouTube, man, yeah. you can do anything. Well, there, there's nothing wrong with doing a Linux Academy or Udemy or 100%. something like yeah. that. You know, I mean, that, those are all good things. Yep. All right, awesome. Sarah, you got another question for us? Next up is from Pseudo Sue Celerex. Sue Sue Studio. Shout out to Phil Collins <laughs> for a throwback. <right back. laughs> when it comes to mission critical assets, does Rackspace offer redundancy? 
Absolutely. Boy, does it. Azure, Boy, does Azure it. <laughs> offers redundancy. Absolutely. Not only do we have redundancy within Azure, but we have redundancy within people, practices, procedures. Uh, we're a 24-7, 365 global organization. Uh, Rackspace never has a day off. Absolutely not. Yeah. Ask, ask Rackspace, reach out to get HADR capabilities, especially on something that's mission critical uh, for the, I mean, a lot of the times it can be completely re-architected just to be seamless and through. So, yeah. And that's actually part of our component offering within modern operations. Uh, we put hands on keyboard to help enable, you know, simple things, backups, uh, DR failover, being sure we're meeting business continuity uh, goals and, and SLA. So it is in our bread and butter. We've been doing this thing for 22 years. So we, we welcome the opportunity to do more of it. Works in 258, 366. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Sarah, we got one more. One we more. do, we do. Our last question is again from Rascal Forrest. He's really just trying Rascal, to, you know, up those cooler? entries Andy. for those yeah. for those prizes okay. here. Um, but uh, the other question and what he wants to know is as storage becomes quicker and cheaper on the consumer side, why does it seem like enterprise solutions continue to rise in price? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll take the first quick stab, and, and a lot of that is just because as the, the technology offerings, especially in SaaS, continue, they, they're doing a lot more developing and coding on top of securing and decoupling and actually working on processing. So where, where you get a lot cheaper in cost optimization is owning that data engineering yourself and then exposing that to different apps and, and capabilities. So when you're, when you're combining everything into a SaaS point solution, that's why the prices typically go up, is because the security infrastructure has to be more, um, you're doing a lot more logging, some other capabilities, and they're also developing their own connectors to work with really on a multi-cloud, you know, within all three of the major hyperscalers. So that's usually the trend that we've seen on, on why it's going up, but you know, as storage and, and processing continues to, to go down, that's where opportunities for you to own a little bit of that data engineering where you can capture cost optimization. That makes sense. I, not knowing that side of it, I would assume, you know, the consumer side, you know, versus like the corporate side, there's going to be a lot more complexity, right? I think on the consumer side, it's a little bit more plug and play, just let it go, let it rip, just yeah. plug it in and it'll work. Where I think on the corporate side, you know, for businesses, you need some complexity because there's a lot of processes now we're trying to make money and we're trying to make this stuff make sense it's not like just taking your photos and just dumping it somewhere uh -huh. and you have it and you feel better and you go to we need to make this stuff make that's all that's what i'm guessing why there would be a little bit of well it's, there's a it's lot also, more complexity it's easier to consume yeah. you right. know i mean yeah. i mean it's much more it's, it's more readily available you know you can you, you tend to consume consume more you know i mean going back to assessments and, and i know we're running short on time but you know, one of the things is um, addressing, um, you know, FinOps, you know, and, and what that looks like. It's like, right. you know, where do we need to, to cut the consumption of the things that we're doing and where can we increase? And then over time, it's this shifting, I'm consuming more, but I'm paying less, uh, you know. And so that's, that's one of the core tenets of adopting the, the cloud is, you know, doing more with less, right. you know, again, you know. Um, but we didn't plan these callbacks, by the way, too. It just happened. Yeah. That was, yeah. or we're just calling back everything. We just TLDR'd everything we've been talking <laughs> about the entire time. Yeah. So good call, Chase. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. Those were great questions. So we're going to pick, uh, pick a winner here soon. But before we go, uh, I'm going to give you guys each an opportunity to give your log line of this movie that we just all viewed. Uh, I was thinking Lake House, and I was like, oh, man, I remember Keanu Reeves, Sandra oh, Bullock. Yeah. Keanu <laughs> Reeves was in there. He was Neo. He worked with data, ones and zeros. It's all together. I see hexagons. So, <laughs> so uh, Luke, we'll start with you. So what's the TLDR you want the viewers to walk away with? Oh, I mean, 100% that that the investment that you've made in your data capabilities, you know, building your lake house architecture, maybe your visualization, Power BI, that is just as important as establishing and fostering a data culture. So don't forget about the other side of the coin. Data capabilities equals data culture. They have to both be developed at the same time. 100% makes sense. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up again. Keep it Aggie simple. Aggie closing. <laughs> Aggie simple people. Um, <laughs> like my missus says, don't just talk about it, be about it. Yeah. Right? Got to activate. Stop talking and do it. Right? Yeah. And then we always like to round out our day at the family house with, um, as we tell our three-year-old, make smart choices, <laughs> right? That just make smart choices and it's gonna come yeah. back to you tenfold. <laughs> I see you driving away from a client and drive, make good choices. Make good choices, <laughs> sign the contract by today. <laughs> awesome, our Jason, let's finish it off. What's uh, the- uh, Cloud's a journey, man, take the ride. All right. That, that's it, <laughs> Amen, brother. you know, just get started.
get started and do it, you know? Figure it out as you go, it's awesome. Yeah, and it totally makes it like, yeah, the analysis paralysis. If you mm -hmm. are sitting there for waiting for perfect conditions, once this happens, I'll move, yeah. you'll never go anywhere. Life just doesn't work like that. Once I have this, then I can do that. Yeah. Universe can't multiply by zero. You have to take at least one step yep. before you can start adding on to those steps. That's right. This is fun. This is yeah. good stuff. That's I really cool. learned a lot. So let's let's give away some of that sweet swag that you guys brought. So Sarah, swag, swag, swag. swag. I know yes. the time we've all been waiting That's for. Right. Okay, so we do have some winners. Again, thank you so much for all of your fabulous questions. We really appreciate them. However, it's time to announce the winners. Today, the winner of the $25 Amazon e gift card is. Pseudo Sue Celerex. I know. Congrats. And then next, the Rack Space Cooler Bag goes to. Rascal Forest. Rascal. That'll fit you two briskets and a six pack of beer. That's, right. <laughs> That's all you need. Perfect. It's all That's you need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. The next prize, the JBL Bluetooth speaker, goes to Death by Band Aid. Yes. Yay! <laughs> And the grand prize winner of the OLED Nintendo Switch. I can't wait to see what you do with it. Hopefully Animal Crossing is one of the things you download. That is going to Skill Point. Nice. I know, right? Uh, congratulations to all of our winners. Thank you again, Spice Heads. We couldn't do this without you. We will absolutely follow up in the community to get your contact information so we can send you those prizes. Back all to right. you, Jeff. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much. You crushed it today. You were hosting, you're chat hosting. You got my shirt, my wallet, and my phone, right? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, I have to dip after this. So, oh. <laughs> so we'll we'll figure that yeah, out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So thank you so much. So guys, again, thank you. This was a great thank conversation. You, thank you for having us. Going. Yeah, yeah. This is awesome. But let's keep that conversation going. So you can cyber stalk any of us. Go in the community or find us on resource. If you have more questions, we want to always keep these conversations going because it's all about relationships with our vendors, our partners, and with you, the community. So don't forget to also follow us in the community on the on the air group. And yeah, we can just keep that conversation going. Other than that, we're all wrapped up. I am Jeff Gretler, and don't forget to check yourself before you wreck yourself. We'll see you next time.